Hey everyone, and a very happy Tuesday and welcome to our Arm Tech Talk series. This is the place for the latest and greatest in trends, technologies, best practices from Arm and our ecosystem partners. It's great you could join us wherever you're joining us from. If it's your morning, your afternoon, your evening, great you can join us for another Tech Talk Tuesday. So today we're going to hear about Remote It and their integration with Arm virtual hardware devices. I'm really excited for today. It's got a great demo. There's an opportunity for you to go and try this out afterwards. It's one of the perfect tech talks, really. It covers everything you'd want from a tech talk. Before we get started, I've got a couple of things that I want to run through. If you've been to one of our tech talks before, you know the drill with this. Uh, but if you haven't, particular warm welcome to you. So let's head over to the next slide and I'll tell you a bit more about how you can ask questions and how you can watch all of our prior tech talks. Thank you so much. Brenda for that. And here we are. We can you can tweet us using the hashtag arm tech talks. We've done 60, 70 nearly of these tech talks, and you can view all of them on demand. Head to youtube.com slash arm to do so. Uh, we've got a playlist there of all the tech talks, and you can view all of them, whether it's from AI to IoT, we've got you covered, and there'll be a lot more topics coming over the next few months. And indeed, talking about upcoming talks, you can head to arm.com slash tech talks. And we've got an upcoming schedule that we're just finalizing. Um, and actually, yeah, let's head over to the next slide just to look through that. Um, and thank you so much. So we've got a few weeks break now because next week we'll be at TinyML Summit. Uh, if you're going to be there, please do let us know. Just uh, write a little message in the chat uh, or give us a buzz on email or wherever. Uh, we'd love to hear from you because we're going to be there. Or our partners are going to be there. It's going to be a great event. Keynotes, presentations, posters, the lot. Really excited. And then we've got a couple of weeks break because it is Easter, uh, but we've got a schedule that we're going to publish on Thursday. So check back to the arm.com website uh, before Thursday and you'll see the talks for April and hopefully into May as well. Uh, I've got a little sneak peek of them and they're really exciting. So we're going to talk about today's uh, topic, which talks about remote it and the integration with Arm virtual hardware. Um, but before I hand over to Brenda and Robo and the remote it team, and before Brenda introduces herself, um, this is one of the rare times I'm not only the kind of a little compare, the host, but I actually get to present a couple of information slides on um, on virtual hardware in this case. So, uh, Brenda, would you mind flicking to the next slide, please? And I'll talk through on virtual hardware because, you know, we're going to talk about how Remoted have integrated it. But a lot of you and hopefully some of you have heard of it. A lot of you may not have heard of on virtual hardware. So what actually is this? And there's only two slides, so you'll only be hearing from me for a couple more minutes. Uh, before Brenda uh, cracks on with her tech talk with Robo from Remote It. So on virtual hardware, what is it? It's a virtual functional representation of a physical hardware. It provides a, a programmer's view to write code from bring up. And whilst it's not a cycle accurate representation for more performance analysis or timing critical applications, it's a functional representation that really helps you get your code up running uh, and does so very quickly. You know, it runs and scales easily in the cloud. It's a portfolio, an umbrella of different technologies that we bring the right class of technology for your workload needs, whether that's Cortex-M, Cortex-A based devices. We have the capability to suit it to your, to your workloads without the reliance on RTL or silicon availability. Um, so we're really excited about this portfolio of offerings. And actually on the next slide, we've got the a bit more detail about what that portfolio offers. So we've got ARM virtual hardware for, for Cortex-M devices as reference configurations across our Cortex-M portfolio. And if you're using Cortex-M in the field and you want to try moving your software development to the cloud and test them, you can try this out for our Cortex-M processors. Uh, we also have the total solution platforms that we call Corestone. Uh, these are complete with some of the IoT SDK that's been ported and running and is delivered with ARM virtual hardware as a component to it. Uh, across Cortex-M and our Ethos Micro MPU lineup and Cortex-A. And these are pre-integrated and pre-verified subsystems that we've got here. And these first two rows are focused on fast model based, uh, primarily fast model based and packaged up as ARM virtual hardware and are available cloud natively. And they're subsystems from ARM. But the latest incarnation of ARM virtual hardware, which is what we're going to talk about today, particularly on the Raspberry Pass, Pi side, is on the third party ecosystem boards. Uh, and this has, you know, there's we've listed three today. Actually, there's a few more, and you can go and check those out on the website from our partners, as well as our um, FVPs, Fixed Virtual Platform Technologies, also available there. Um, and these are some of the most compelling IoT devices that we have uh, on this on this service. Uh, it's available today via a private beta, 
So you can sign up, you can request access, and uh, we can grant you access to, to try this out. It's all free, and it uses a hypervisor-based technology, so you can run on an ARM-based server um, on these ARM Graviton servers, kind of running ARM on ARM, which is really pretty cool. So we're going to actually see that in action, as I mentioned today, with the, the Raspberry Pi uh, interface uh, and the Raspberry Pi device, sorry, that Remote are going to interface with. Uh, so that's a bit about virtual hardware, functional representation of a physical SOC and third-party ecosystem boards for you to go and try out and really accelerate your software development and test by being able to parallelize and run tests in the cloud, whether that's yourself writing the code or using various tools out there. So let's talk about remote it today. And I'm delighted to be joined, now we've set the context about on virtual hardware, by Brenda from remote it. So Brenda's just going to flick her camera on and I'm going to let her introduce herself in a second. Uh, before we do, uh, if you've got any questions for Brenda and Robo, who's also on the call from Remote It, then or myself, then please do use the Q&A box. It's in the uh, little menu bar on Zoom at the bottom. We'd love to hear your questions as they come in. Um, so that's enough little housekeeping from me. Brenda, it's great you could join us. We're really thrilled to have you today. Uh, why don't you introduce yourself? Tell us a bit more about yourself and then take it away with today's demo. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you. Thank you, Tobias. Today, um, well, I'm Brenda Stretch, Director of Developer Relations at Remoteit. I've been a software developer for over 20 years, and I've had experience with web, API, mobile development in various languages, uh, as well as big data. And uh, currently in my role at Remoteit, I assist embedded engineers with manufacturing and access processes. So what is Remote It? Remote It helps you primarily just make connections to your devices. We support a various types of services, SSH, VNC, and uh, you know, database connections, API connections, and microcontrollers as long as they run on a port. And uh, here I'm showing you uh, some in the purple lines here, a virtual network that would be put together in the remoted ecosystem where a user would have access to the web application on multiple Raspberry Pis. As you can see here, I have got an ARM uh, developments area where I've got a couple of Raspberry Pis implemented and deployed to the field with my code. And then in the field, I've also started production. So I've got a couple of different locations there on various types of network connections. So uh, cellular and satellite are supported. And this user also can belong to another net virtual network and make connections to an API server up in the cloud. And here's what it might look like put all together where I have a developer on their homeland who is allowed to connect to that same Raspberry Pi web network, uh, as well as all the different uh, resources at AWS, uh, like a couple of different databases and the API. I also can make a connection to uh, devices or ports in the field uh, from a cloud server. So this might be something like you're fetching information from your Raspberry Pis uh, and the field. And now I'm going to talk about remote access to your virtual devices. So you can make connections using the Remoted desktop application, and you can make those connections through the internet, and uh, you have the you can make a P2P connection, which would be a direct machine to machine, or you can do a proxy connection uh, in cases where a P2P connection might not work. And we also have a remote it uh, um, mobile web <laughs> mobile application, sorry about that, uh, that can also make those connections to those devices. And in different situations, you might also have, uh, different servers also connecting 
to devices. And the connection in this case could also go the other way to like a cloud uh, service. Uh, the uh, We can provide, uh, prevent, um, provide connections to different kinds of applications on your Raspberry Pis or in the clouds, uh, like uh, MySQL or any database or web application. If you can see here down at the bottom, all those connections in remote it look like a local host and IP address and with random ports assigned by remote it. This means that there is no external ingress from any other users to my connections or my devices and services in the field. This eliminates our, the way that remote it does it, eliminates IP uh, address allow lists, maintaining those, subnets, security groups, and routing tables. Uh, developers can connect directly to their devices and services at the same time without the complications of VPNs and sub colliding subnets. So now on with the demo. Today we're going to talk about connecting using remote it and access control to your remote it register devices via organizations, direct shares, and scripting, activity logs, and our GraphQL uh, overview, uh, which is our API that connects to, does all the things that we're doing in remote it. And then the installation and setup of Remoted on your Raspberry Pi, followed by Q&A. So let's get started. Okay, so on the screen here, I've got my ARM virtual environment where I've already created a virtual Raspberry Pi. And now I'm going to go to my remoted application, where you can see I've got a whole bunch of different uh, devices that are already registered to my account. And here's that Butter te textbook device that I've already set up. I've also set up a Node-RED server on this virtual uh, uh, Raspberry Pi, SSH, and VNC. I've already got the connection going to my Node-RED application. And as you can see here, it's assigned a localhost IP address and port. And then I've already launched this in my browser. And as you can see here, it's 127 localhost address and this port 33. 012, which was assigned by Remote It. I can interact with my Ras uh, Raspberry Pi Node Red, drag new things out here, and I can set up another target if I need to for a web application if I set up one against the Node Red server. Going back to Remote It, let's make a connection to SSH here. So I'm going to go ahead and start that connection. And as you can see here, this connection's already started. It's peer-to-peer, -peer, so it's machine-to-machine. -machine. And let's launch this. And let's put in the right password here. And now I am in as an SSH connection to my Raspberry Pi, and I can run any of the commands that uh, I would be able to run on the Raspberry Pi. I can sudo or uh, run as the regular Pi user. I can also log in as different users if I had been, if I had set up those users on my Raspberry Pi. So let's talk about now access control for your remote it registered devices. In remote it, we have the ability to create an organization and add users to your organization as members. Those members can have roles assigned to them, which define their permissions. In your roles, you're automatically given three 
roles, no access, which you may assign to some users for a period of time, a member, which allows them to view and connect to all the devices and services in your organization, and a manager role, which allows them to view, connect, and manage your devices, such as edit, delete, register, and transfer, and do some shares and networks, assign um, services to the networks that you might have created. And these are virtual networks, so you can group random services together as if they are on the same LAN, but you won't have access to all the services on the device. You can also create custom roles, which I've done here, and I've made an admin role, which allows me to manage the members of my organization and tags in the organization. And let's talk about tags for a little bit. You can also create access based on tagging, which you can assign random tags to your devices. You can make multiple tags on a role and you can also change your match rule where it's any, which is an or statement, or all, which is an and statement. You can tag both uh, devices and your virtual networks. Let's take a look at my devices here. I've already assigned my Butter textbook to the tech support role, and I can add any additional tags that I want so that I can have virtual networks with different permissions based on tagging. I can also add different services to a network by clicking on the networks and then assigning a network uh, to the network. And then once I've added to a network, here's my virtual networks here, and I can also tag my virtual networks here. I can also do direct sharing of devices and their services where I don't want to allow permissions to everything. This might be for a contractor or temporary access. And I can go to the device, click share, add, uh, share the device, and enter in email addresses and select which services I want them to be able to do as long as well as script execution. So this brings us into scripting, and I'll show you this feature. This feature is something unique to remote it, where I can run different scripts against a selected number of devices. You can upload your scripts to remote it via this dialog here. I've already uploaded a number of scripts. And as you can see, I have a combination of different languages. I have Python and I have a bash shell script. And really you can upload any script that you want to, uh, as long as it is supported by your device that you're going to send it to. Once I've uploaded the script, I can then choose which devices I want to run that script against. And I'm going to choose that and I will choose the remote it pi and then I will execute that script and I've chosen one of the pies that I cannot actually run a script against so let's unselect that and now I can execute script and then I can pick the script that I want to run. This script itself will be sent to the devices that I would have selected. And it's going to actually update these columns here with data from that Raspberry Pi. And you can see that it's already started executing. It's telling me the information off that uh, Pi there. And it's once it's finished running or while it's in any state, you can see its current state. And uh, then if it's succeeded or failed, you'll know that. And if it's failed, you'll know which devices it's uh, failed against. 
We will attempt to retry the script against devices that are offline as well uh, for a brief period of time. Let's move on to activity logs. A lot of times you want to know who's been doing what on which devices uh, for audit capabilities. And we provide the capability to do that by looking at your logs. You can look at logs at a global level here, which shows you everything that's happened against your account, or you can look at logs against particular devices. And as you can see here, I have connected to the SSH service. You can see that activity. You can see that uh, devices went offline and online as well as uh, various activities like logging in and all that. Now let's look at our GraphQL API. For developers, this might be the best way for you to interact with the remoted ecosystem. And we provide a GraphQL API as well as a collection of sample GraphQL API uh, uh, queries and mutations. If you're not familiar with GraphQL, GraphQL is a JSON-like query language and a return JSON in return. The unique thing about uh, GraphQL is that you can do one call for many different things, which is different than REST. In, um, I'm actually showing you the insomnia tool right now where I've imported this collection so that I can see samples of the queries. I've got a query up here for uh, getting devices by a specific ID. You can also do it by name. And the neat thing about GraphQL and Insomnia so that you can develop your query is that you can have autocomplete. And uh, there are samples here of, of the things that I can do with this. I can see when it's last reported, for example, and then I can run the query against that. And then I'll show you some of the sample queries that you can do. I have this broken out into organizations, which you can see some samples of things that you can do under organizations. So anything that you can do in the remoted apps, you can do within the GraphQL API, barring a peer-to-peer -peer connection. So I've got account queries and mutations. And mutations you should think of as a put or a post. These are going to be things that modify data up on the server. We can do registration and device recovery. This is um, great for when you deploy devices out to the field and you might have to replace hardware and you basically want to create your device as it was and pick up uh, where it was in your um, system so that you can preserve logs and things like that. I can do custom attributes and queries against our devices and tag them and add multiple tags to devices. And I can delete tags. I can make connections. I can get active sessions and then we also have activity uh, logging and feeds. So this is what I showed you in the logs and devices and services. So you can add your devices, you can add services to them, you can get all your devices and so forth. We also have a web hook that you can tie into where you can get the online offline status of devices as they occur. Now let's go on to the good stuff. Let's look at installation and setup of remote on your virtual Raspberry Pi. I'll bring up the AVH environment here. So we're going to spin up a new Raspberry Pi. And I'm going to select an OS for it. In this case, I'm going to select a Raspberry Pi OS Lite. 
and I'm going to go ahead and create that device. Now, one thing about Remote It is that we are uh, compatible with a number of devices, OpenWRT and Linux-based systems. Uh, we also can install on Windows and Macs and uh, allow you to have your Mac or your Windows servers, for example, be a target of a connection. And, and all our documentation is available at docs.remoteit. And as you can see, it's spun up the environment here in just one moment. I'll have access to it. And then I'm going to show you how you register a remote device in the environment here. Uh, another thing I didn't mention is that we also can uh, support Docker uh, containers as well, which has sometimes been problematic for people to actually make connections directly. And so now I am ready. And I'm going to go over here to the connect screen and I'm going to install remote it. And this is uh, running a little install script here on my virtual Raspberry Pi. And it will return a claim code in just a moment that I will put into my remote application here. So I'm clicking add device. And as you can see here, there's a number of devices that I can support in here, both virtual and physical hardware. And now I'm just claiming my device. And in a moment, it'll be registered with my system. And then I can add services to my Raspberry Pi. And uh, I can add services at any point. So this uh, right now, at the moment, I only have an SSH uh, service running. And if I had done a uh, Raspberry Pi with a desktop, I would also be able to run VNC. And, and now my Raspberry Pi is ready to connect via SSH. Let's go ahead and connect. It's assigned a new port. And what a unique thing for remote connections is if you use the desktop application and you make a connection, these connections are ready on demand. So what this means is that you launch, you launch your connection once and you can bookmark it in whatever application you need. It'll go idle at a period after a period of time of you not using it. And then once you try to use it again, it'll trigger it to reconnect. So I'm putting in my username. If I had set up a um, hem key for this, I could also modify uh, my, well, Got a little bit of an error there. Let's see what's happened here. Okay, well, it looks like I've actually set up a PEM key and I didn't capture it. So, um, but the connection would work the same as um, anything else. Uh, you can set up your service configuration here where you can set up your connection default. Unfortunately, I didn't grab my PEM key, but you can change your command template to add the arguments that you need for your PEM key and the path for it. As you can see, we have uh, some tokens here that you can use, and those will automatically populate into the command. And then you could also put the hard-coded path to your PEM key in here. So um, with that, we are ready for, um, let me see here, 
Sorry, I've got to change my screen here. And uh, I'm going to provide some resources here. Our ARM has a learning path set up already for virtual hardware. In there is the various different um, hardware that they support. And uh, there's also information on remote it. For developer documentation, we also have docs dot remote it available, which would uh, allow you to see everything and set up everything for GraphQL, as well as the authentication methods you need for actually making the real API calls. Um, and then we also have a forum available for any questions that you may have. That, I'm going to turn it over to Tobias. Um, since uh, he's been collecting some questions. Yeah, amazing. Thank you so much, Brenda. An amazing talk, great demo. And uh, the demo got shone for 90%, I think, of the talk. So we're all good <laughs> and everything went without a hitch. Um, so if you're interested in signing up, these are the two links to follow, app.remote.it and avh, avh.arm.com. That's where you can access the service, try it out. We'd love your feedback. We'd love to uh, hear how you're using it and uh, how it's inspired you. As ever, I've got a couple of questions on my side. I'd love to ask Brenda, but now's the time for you to ask questions. You know, we've got a good 10 minutes plus or so of Q&A time. So we'd love to hear your questions um, and uh, and to hear from you. As just a reminder, as I've had a couple of pings on, on chat and uh, apologies if I uh, missed this out earlier, the recording and slides from today are gonna be available within 24 hours after this. The recording actually will be live immediately because it's just a YouTube live stream. So if you've missed anything, catch it there. And the slides will be available within 24 hours, just depends on uh, publishing schedules and things like that for us. So let's jump into the Q&A. And as I say, please do get your questions in. I've got a couple. We'd love to hear from you as to what yours are. Um, so obviously, you know, Brenda and, and Robo and Tim have got a great presentation there, right? And would love to hear from you, Brenda, on what the, the kind of difference in process is for a virtual Raspberry Pi on, on virtual hardware and uh, a physical Raspberry Pi, which many of the audience will no doubt own or um, know someone who does. So can I could I mix virtual and physical devices on the same network? Absolutely. That's one of the cool things about remote. It. We don't distinguish between virtual devices, uh, you know, or uh, actual physical devices. You can mix and match any of the devices themselves services into the network um, networks and you can uh, in particular you can also have multiple uh, uh, a device or service uh, the services of a device belong to multiple networks and users themselves can also have access to multiple networks that's awesome that's absolutely awesome thank you for that and in terms of you know i, I think People obviously think about security with any kind of, you know, virtual device or devices full stop. What about the data transmission? Is it secure with remote? Is the data encrypted? Could you talk a bit more about that? Yes, absolutely. So our data is encrypted. We actually create a tunnel and then that tunnel itself is encrypted. Plus you get the native encryption of whatever protocol you're using. Awesome. And we there is uh, different types of encryption that we can support as well. Fab. So that will hopefully cover a lot of people's any security concerns people have for sure. So um, hopefully that's um, that's answered a few people's questions on that. And, you know, obviously you're connecting to a virtual device here. You know, there's bandwidth and network capabilities. Um, are there any requirements there from a network or bandwidth perspective? And, you know, um, uh, and indeed some of the, and also I guess, you know, more generally some IoT devices have quite limited um bandwidth right so could you talk a bit more about the bandwidth and network side of things when uh, we're talking about these virtual devices and your remote integration sure we actually have customers with a number of devices out in the field with uh you know like 3g cellular modems which do have quite a limited uh bandwidth uh so you know a short of whatever bandwidth requirement is needed for the protocol, uh, we don't have a bandwidth requirement. So, uh, you know, 
are users out there in the field. You're not going to on 3G, you know, do an RTSP feed um, without some jittering, um, but you can easily do um, SSH and some of the other protocols. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for that. And I actually want to talk a bit more about the, the AVH integration because we've had a question in about can remote it run any ARM device? And I guess I'd extend that by saying, you know, within that ARM virtual hardware um, service that we've got that um, folks can try out and follow that link there to sign up for. What ARM based device, what ARM devices on there do you support on ARM virtual hardware? What into what works with that integration? All right. Um, actually, I'm going to have Robo help me with the this answer. Um, but, uh, you know, in general, it's uh, any Linux based uh, operating system. Um, and then Robo, you can help also with this question. Yeah, so we we support a lot of ARM virtual hardwares, but the or ARM Raspberry Pis, um, ARM on you know AWS cloud. Um, but it is, as far as the AVH goes, right now I think we're limited to the Raspberry Pis. It's still in beta, and so we're working on some of the other platforms <clears throat> that we uh, we can support. But as far as other ARM devices in general, you can't say every ARM device probably, um, but quite a few of them. We have a whole list of platform checks that we do and uh, download certain packages for installation based on those platform checks. Awesome. Thank you. And that's great to hear. So you not only got the the dedicated Raspberry Pi integration, but what's great to hear, as you say, is, you know, there's for the AMVH side of things, but more generally, you know, you've got a lot of support for, for ARM, which, of course, we we love to hear in an ARM tech talk. Um, so that's great. And, for, and as I say, folks, do keep your um, keep your questions coming in. We'd love to hear any questions you've got for for Brenda, for Robo and the team. Um, and of course, you can follow up with us and um, and any of us afterwards if you've got any questions that, that spark your imagination based on today's great demo and uh, and indeed presentation on that. Um, and I guess talking about the devices, right, let's talk about the support of these smaller IoT devices like sensors. You know, do you support that? Um, as long as it has an operating system that we can install on, or the other option is if you have a device like a Raspberry Pi that's kind of going to be the controller of it and and uh, access, you can actually install remote it on the other device and then create a virtual jump to those devices. Uh, this we call uh, Jump Services, and you just register another service to your one device that's registered on that LAN and uh, just add the IP address of that as the target and the port. Awesome. Thank you so much. That's all the questions I had, and I'd love to hear anyone if else with the audience has got it. But I guess before we do, on Robo, on your side, I'd love to hear from you if there's anything else you'd like to to emphasize or talk about from from today's talk obviously you guys have done phenomenal work working with us on the avh integration is there anything else you'd like to highlight or or mention that um you know that we've maybe already covered today or that you want to particularly um, highlight or show from your side yeah i just want to um first i want to extend on the answer for the arm support and i think you know one of the answers is try to install it on your arm device and if it doesn't work contact our support we're very quick at responding and trying to find the right um, executables for your device. So if try it, you know, I want to make sure that's, uh, you know, well, you know, well, well out there for people to use. Um, the other thing is, you know, one thing I, I have to say about our connections is we talked about a little bit about bandwidth there. And I want to elaborate a little bit more on that. We were designed for devices, IoT devices up front in the very first thing. And so our usage is very small. It's, it's optimized for devices in the field that are very remote and don't have high bandwidth or you know, uh, lots of power um, and all that. So a lot of it also depends on what you're accessing. So if you're accessing a remote camera that's streaming video, for example, you're going to need a little more bandwidth you know, than what you um have for like brenda said ssh so you know uh but the and the connections are no inbound um access lists right so our connections when like if if you're on aws and you understand security groups there's no open port on our security groups 
it, your, your security groups are, are blank. They could just have nothing. And we can, as long as they can get out to the internet, we can make a connection to it usually. So it's no open ports. And that's, you know, important when it comes down to these connections, not only are they secure, there's no footprint for people to attack. You know, there's no port that they can try and attack. And then lastly on this, I want to make it clear that unlike VPN, where you give somebody access to your network over VPN, um, once you give them access, they have access to the whole subnet. They have access to that network. And so they can play around, go look around and all this. With us, you're connecting directly to a service and they only have access to that service. And so they can't access, say, if they have access to a developer database, they don't have access to your production database. Right. They can't go ping around for other databases. They can't go look around for other services running on that network or that subnet. It's it's a point to point, peer to peer, um, as Brenda said, P2P, peer to peer connection. So and sometimes proxy. But, you know, the, the thing is, it's very limited in in who you can talk to. And that's what makes us very nice on the zero trust front. Awesome. Thank you. I always love doing that because um, it's always great to hear what people um, are passionate about and want to emphasize a bit more and um, and and talk about. So thank you for that. And, and Brenda, do you want to add anything else on top of that? Um, yeah, I just wanted to add one more thing is that if your virtual device actually needs to talk uh, itself to a cloud or some other device, you can actually install our CLI, which has the capability to generate connections via command line to something else. In most cases, you actually want to make, you only need to make connections to your remote device, like those IoT devices in the field. So um, that's another option that you can do. Uh, you know, most of the time, like if you have a cloud environment, you would have your cloud environment reach out to your IoT devices. Amazing. Thank you. And we've just had a question come in about what devices are supported from ST uh, with Remotix. So do you want to just quickly answer that? Um, all right. Um, yeah, we've been installed on a number of ST device models. Uh, you know, as Robo said, try it. If it doesn't work, uh, we we can take the output from uh, the command line that you use to install and likely come up with the, the right package. It just might be that we're not detecting it correctly. Awesome. Well, as it's just gone quarter two and we haven't got any more questions, I think we can wrap up there. So. Robo, Brenda, thank you ever so much for a great presentation today. Do you have anything final to add as a thank you to our uh, and thank you to our attendees? And do you have anything final to add? Uh, um, from my point of view, thank you very much for joining uh, this Tech Talk. And I hope you try out Remote It, you, not only in your ARM virtual environment, but take it on to your production environments as well. I think you'll find that you'll really like the capability of connections, especially with uh, cellular and satellite connections where you have a CG natted connection that you do not have an external IP address and uh, remote it will work there. And you don't have to do a whole lot of networking uh, uh, rigmarole or, you know, uh, uh, um, the hard stuff about networking and getting uh, ports opened and things like that, potentially on customer networks. Robo, on your side? I just want to say, Tobias, thank you for having us. And uh, thank you, everyone, for joining. Amazing. Thank you both so much. Great presentation. Thank you, audience. And we'll see you in a few weeks time for our upcoming Tech Talks scheduled to be released later this week. So head to arm.com slash Tech Talks for everything else. And uh, hope you have a good Easter if you celebrate it. And we look forward to seeing you another of our Arm Tech Talks soon for all the latest in the trends, technologies and best practices that influence Arm and our ecosystem. So thank you ever so much. We'll see you again soon.